And last, this afternoon, we've got Big Hill Station, Mr. Bill Graysbrook. Just got a few matters um, before that, but then we'll we'll get into the rest of the hearing the submissions. Just got a bit of a shopping list um, so far. Um, I just in no particular order, and I think we'll we'll start to do them every few days, just groups of them as we're leading up until that into that Wednesday of um, the week after next. Um, first one's just around. Um, we'd be interested in getting some either flow diagrams or scenarios of different activities at different scales and just seeing what the consent pathway looks like for those. Um, you would have heard some of the submitters talking about the different scales of the farms and the different activities and it would be just good to, to see what that looks like. And one of the things I'm particularly interested in is just seeing the difference between the permitted activity status vis-a-vis -vis the discretionary. But we can come back to you with more detail if, if you like on that. Um, the next one's just the re regards to stop drinking takes. And I'm just interested in knowing where and how the stop drinking takes have been accounted for in the model. I I'm suspecting they're there, but um, certainly for myself, I'm just wanting to see exactly where and how that it's been accounted for. Um, in terms of, um, this, is, this is a little bit obscure, in terms of it, whether the council had a, a view in terms of looking at the legal counsel in, in this regards, in regards to the matters raised by Logue Incorporated, in regards to the scope of the delegation and whether that included withdrawal, that's, that's not a matter that I tend my mind to and my, my thought was unless it is specified then we haven't been delegated that authority, so I'm seeing some nods, but just, just some... Um, advice on that regard. Um, this is more of a general question. Um, how will the municip municips <laughs> the takes for municipal supply be affected pro by proposed plan change nine? Um, and, and, and if so, any particular uses that might be as a, that, is a, that used at municipal supply? I've done a search through the section 42A and the 32 and it just wasn't ob obvious to me, even though municipal supply comes up a number of times, um, you're just understanding how, how that, if, if there's any direct effect on it. Um, this one's a, a specific one because it was topical today. This was um, table three, I think, in schedule 35. And there was those different the methodologies for determining source protection, and I think I know what the table does, especially in light of the Hawke's Bay um, governance body for drinking water. But it'd be just good to have an explanation of how that table actually works in implementation, or whether it's just for information. Um, and the last one is just looking forward to that uh, Wednesday, the twenty third of the month, and we've we've got you up last. And in the morning is Hawke's Bay and Napier District Council, and I, I'm sure they'll be, that they are bringing a number of issues. And so if you had any views about how you'd like to respond to the submissions heard thus far, um, knowing that that's on the Wednesday afternoon after probably a, a big morning, and how you might want to do that. So that's, that's the shopping list. This file, and can I just add to that the rationale for the 20 cubic metre a day restriction for stock water supplies? I think I think I've read something about it, but I can't I can't remember where it was and whether that is um, designed as a um, primarily on the basis of just a supply constraint, a number rather than a consideration of um, and this, these aren't the right words, actual and reasonable needs for stock on larger properties, if you like. And the difference between stochastic uncertainty analysis <laughs> and sensitivity analysis. Somebody's nodding down the back. <laughs>
would you like us to respond to all of those questions? Do you want them within a day or so, or at the end of the week, or yeah, um, on I'm, the final week? I'm, I'm just not sure how, how you want us to come back to you on those Yeah. What I've been thinking about whether we know we've packed a Friday each week of the hearing and then we try and get all those by the next Friday. But I think just we'll, as we go, do a shopping list. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the Friday of this week would be would, would be great unless that, that's an issue for you. But just come back onto us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank and you. while while I, while we're saying that, thank you very much for the groundwater analysis provided yeah. last week. That was really helpful. Mm. I'd read something about peripheral aquifers in the section 32, but then I found something much more detailed about what they were. So that was very helpful. Mm. Thank you. Do let us know if you have any questions as a consequence. I was just saying, do let us know if you have any questions as a consequence yes. of that paper. Uh, 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 no. Okay. No, you've, fine. you've read it? Okay. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. We've got, um, let's go back to our schedule. Tūra Moi Farm, Mr. Stuart McIntyre. Oh, we'll carry on. JNS White Contracting, Mr. Jeremy White and others. Welcome. Come forward. Here, yes, just come up the front. <laughs> Make yourselves comfortable. Right. You've got the whole table to yourselves. Yeah, g'day. Um, I'm uh, Matthew Trubridge, so um, I'm um, speaking on behalf of um, Jeremy and Sharon White, uh, JNS Contracting, um, up at um, the top of uh, from Waihau Road, which is... Um, I, I didn't quite catch your surname, sorry. Uh, tru my name is Matthew Trubridge. Trubridge, thank you. Yep. I'm actually submitting at the end of the week. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. And Jeremy has yes. asked if I could just uh, act on his behalf um, to um, just um, submit his um, submission uh, presented. Yep. And so, yep, we just, um, yeah, so here we are. Thank you. That's, <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, cool. So um, Sharon, Sharon, Jeremy's wife, and, and himself uh, have been farming in the White House stream catchment for the last four years. Um, and they farm on 300 hectares uh, sheep and beef farm, um, and this is their first farm. In, our, in the last four years, it's been very challenging times, and uh, and they've had a, uh, there's been significant challenges. And uh, yeah, just just to just to lay a little bit, set a little bit of a scene here on some background, um, and it's been quite incredible, just incredibly uh, challenging to stay afloat. Uh, probably utterly exhausting. We've had uh, two consecutive years of autumn drought, and uh, and uh, on top of that, they've had Mycoplasma bovis, which has devastated their income, and are still yet to recover. But fortunately, like a lot of rural landowners, they are resilient, they are resourceful, and uh, and they are there to improve their land as part of the ethos. They have stayed focused and have continued to voluntary fence and plant significant areas uh, to enhance their property uh, with uh, in, improving waterways, um, which includes the Wai House stream, which is, which is one of the significant areas in the, in the, um, the priority catchment. And this, this, this has come also with help from the Regional Council. They, um, they like, they, Jeremy and Sharon have said they like to be really flexible. They like flexibility, and it is re they, they, they regard that as being crucially crucial to their survival in their farming system. They are strongly opposed any regulation that imposes extra costs and inflexibility. 
and I guess around that recent droughts have highlighted this and the need for flexibility as one season is not like the other. As a bare minimum, as a bare minimum, the rule should contribute and balance education and this was really evident for themselves through their experience with M. Bovis and how little perhaps the regulators then were familiar with farming operations and that, yeah, and that, you know, one of the suggestions come out of Wellington that they probably need to plough up their whole farm and their farm is kind of like, you know, it's kind of quite pretty rolling terrain. So just to set that scene, um, that's, that's just the prelude. And then the, the basis of um, Jeremy and Sharon's submission is, is in support of the beef and lamb submission, which was, um, and then they'd like to just, um, just comment on some areas that they made their submission around that. They strongly support the catchment collectives as promoted and with the, with the basis in, of, um, having, of creating good landowner buy-in. Stock and domestic drinking water is, is a key one for them. They have submitted opposing the requirement to, to consent for this. As a minimum, drinking water is a basic necessity for stock domestic health and survival. And in Jeremy says, there, in their view, there should be no limit for this water take, nor the need to monitor from any water source for stock and domestic. In his opinion, there should be no influence on the way we farm with regards to stock's basic need for water. This ensures the welfare of animals is protected and no matter what the climatic conditions. While M. Bovis alone created a lot of anxiety, in the middle of summer, they had 800 cattle on and their water bought failed. This highlighted to them the need to have ready and accessible water without the need for regulatory consent under a matter of urgency. Jeremy and Sharon support farm plans being created by landowners without the need for consultants or specialists. In their situation, or in our situation, he says that it's an empowering the landowner and gives them a sense of buy-in. We have a couple of photos that we would just like to use um, on the last point which um, was just to demonstrate voluntary, um, some vo voluntary planting that Jeremy has um, completed and just some stream enhancement. Is that correct, Jeremy, in that yeah. picture? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, that was just a picture of the stock removal. We have another picture there, please, of some pole planting uh, carried out by Jeremy and Sharon on some faces that were high risk. Um, and I understand this was in conjunction with the regional council. That's right. Yep, yep. And then there was another photo there just to demonstrate um, this is the Waihau River running through the middle and um, all that far face that they have um, voluntarily planted in native species and, um, and fenced off and removed the stock from. Without regulation, it's, it's what they've, um, as a landowner, feel that they needed to do. They support objectives to increase riparian planting and wetlands and would like to demonstrate that without regulation we have, they have done this voluntarily. And it's a priority catchment, it's beside the Waihau stream. And the bank and the and the stream was all exposed when they first took the property on. So um, it's quite a commitment. And just one final point that I'd like to see recognition and a register of existing and new riparian planting done to date. That's, um, that's, um, the, that's the end of our submission. Sure, sure. Yep. Thank you.
I'm not sure we'll have questions for you because you're, you're, you're presenting on behalf. Sure. It would be unfair to do that. But think, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just double check to see if there are any open questions. Can I ask Jeremy just a couple of questions, please? Mm. How, how big is your farm, please? Approximately 300 hectares. Sorry? 316 hectares. And whereabouts is it exactly? So the why our stream is... Which uh, is... Partoka. Oh, OK, uh, so up the Tutakuri? That, that's right, yeah. Okay. Yes. And it would largely be um, stream flats and quite hard hill country from what I can that, see. That's right, yes. And your source of stock water is pumped up from the stream into troughs, is that...? No, no from, a, from a, a bore. From a... OK. From a bore. So the bore is, um, it's just reticulated from a bore around the property? Yeah, that's okay, right. Thank you. <clears throat> just to follow on from that, the, so the bore ran dry this summer, I understand? Is no, 20, uh, 2018. It didn't, didn't, didn't actually run dry, actually. It just it, it, it failed down, down below. It was... Um, yeah, it, it was more the fact that, that with the M. Bovis, we didn't have, um, it, 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 no one would come on the property to fix it. Ah, uh, okay. And so, so we needed to do something smartly, so, yeah. So there was still potentially water there in yes. the pool? Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Cool. That's all our questions. Thank you very much for coming in. You're right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank and you. Um, thank you for the pictures. I do notice... Um, I've got your address, and I saw the watercress in the yeah, stream, so the, the, <laughs> the secret there. spot has been identified. Yeah, well, yeah, come <laughs> for a drive. <laughs> well, I, might, uh, I might be able to do a trade-off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. I'll just double-check if we've got uh, anyone from Turamoe Farm. Okay. on their way. Okay, that's great. Uh, Big Hill Station, Mr. Bill Graysbrook. Oh, great. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm Bill Glasbrook, I'm here on behalf of Big Hill Station Limited, which owns Big Hill Station, a um, 2,700 hectare property on the southern bank of the Nauru River as it, uh, as it meets the uh, Rohini Ranges. Mm. Uh, we're sheep and beef farmers on this property and, um, um, and like the previous speaker have... Um, made a big effort to uh, in maintaining um, fence way, f uh, fences and, and stock exclusion from, um, from waterways. Um, I've been farming at Big Hill for since 1987 and um, the front boundary of the property is not far east of the Wanawana Cableway that's often referred to within this tank, tank process and also the WCO that I know some of you are familiar with. Um, <clears throat> while we support the, um, the initiative to, to, uh, to protect the waterways and, and we, we, we Encourage, I guess, that the, the, the setting of what 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 um, what criteria is is useful for the for the people of New Zealand. Um, we do have reservations about how that is um, administered. Um, in summary, we're, we're strong supporters of of. Uh, of self-policing and self-motivation to get it done. I have been um, involved with the um, farmer reference group, which came on quite late in the um, in the tank process. As it was realised, there was actually no partial representatives. 
within the tank process for the first uh, three or four years, which, which seems unbelievable. Well, there were farmers, but there was nobody there in, in direct, in direct um, representation of it. So, so sensibly, um, there was a farmer reference group established, and of which there were, a, were quite a number of us um, contributing, and, um, and it was a very rewarding and uh, interesting and informative process. Hopefully, and hopefully that was reciprocated by the, uh, by the a, a reciprocated experience for the council. Um, <clears throat> so, in, in in the summary, there, um, I point out that the rivers in the Upper Narrow River, especially, are no threat to anyone in their present state. We support the prioritising of areas to be identified for remediation where water quality outcomes do not meet agreed standards. I oppose district and region-wide regulatory measures and rules to remediate issues suggested or alerted to solely by modelling. I believe modelling is a useful alert system, but issues need to be verified by actual data retrieved by scientific monitoring prior to the adoption and enforcement of any regulations. In the absence of actual data to determine hard facts, decisions and subsequent regulatory directives are vulnerable to political pressure or based on personal opinions and perceptions that may be based on no facts at all, limited facts or facts of selected bias. In this scenario, no matter how well-intentioned, the, the chance of decisions being fair and especially correct and accurate are reduced. Um, the other the other reason why um, I take such exception to the regulatory, regulatory approach, which is now now um, included in the in, in, in the change to Plan Change Nine, um, which wasn't before, and, and I thought was a fair trade within the um, within the within the, um, uh, the farmer group representatives with the regional council, was that um, if, you've got, if you've got a problem, we agreed it needed to be fixed. So the catchment group collectives were established, the principle of the, of the catchment group collectives were, were we're more finely tuned within that reference group meetings with the regional council, and one of the uh, one of the criteria I thought of those meetings was that if we've got our own, um, if we can create our own story to this and look after ourselves, then the the farmer barn will be greater, and um, and this was a trade off against regulations, so. Um, First and foremost, the process should be accurate and meaningful data. And I haven't seen any evidence of that in a lot of, in a lot of instances. We were told that um, a lot of streams and whatever, there were, there was, that, that, that the, the catchment is in poor shape. But um, <coughs> we've also been attending the, the Water Conservation Order which claim the waters on our boundary, of which we've got 11 k's, is pristine. So we seem to be arguing for both sides here. One thing we, the common denominator is we just want to be left alone. Um, the, water, the water conditions, it appears, in our catchment on this particular property is in pretty good shape. <coughs> so so why, why now, and, and change and the changes to change plan nine, after all those, those meetings we did with the farmer reference group, is in our regulatory, regulatory uh, initiative. And I was quite aghast to, to see that. And I think it was actually, it's actually quite a slap in the face to the farmer reference group members who put in a lot of time to do that. Um, so, 
So, so the main the main contributing factors for me in 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 the plan change over and above what I've submitted already is that the um, is that we don't live in a catchment like the Waikato, where, where, where I perceive, <laughs> only perceive, that, that there's been a lot of public public interest generated in water quality and that kind of thing from from bona fide uh, deterioration. But we live in a catchment that, that also, as is claimed by interested parties, to be pristine. So I don't see how regulatory Regulatory provisions can fairly reflect all that. Standard regulatory provisions can, can, can reflect that. Um, more so, if there are, if there are agreed or acceptable, acceptable levels of um, uh, attributes, the attribute states, as it's called now, are accepted by all, then, um, and there is a regulatory, and there is a le regulatory uh, provisions within the plan change, then there is no need for collectives. You've got the three initiatives. You've got the level things should be kept at. You've got the regulations that say you must do it. And then you've got catchment groups basically doing the council's work and monitoring it. So the monitoring thing isn't difficult. It's only water testing. We've been coached on how to do it within, um, within, a, within our, we, we had, we're involved in an early catchment collective on another property. And it's, um, the basic things of this aren't hard. So the, um, if you want regulation, regulate it, council. That's their business. It can't be ours. If you want us to look after it, we'll look after it and we'll report back to you. But you can't have both. You've just heard the previous speaker, the, uh, the cost constraints, the, the income constraints they've suffered. The change to the plan change nine um, is adding huge cost in administration to those who A, aren't naturally affiliated with that kind of thing. There's a reason why they're outdoors, hands-on people. And um, those sort of things basically end up just being a cost. So, um, so on that point, I strongly oppose regulations. And if regulations are on there, I strongly oppose the, the catchment collectors that we spent long, so long trying to, uh, trying to establish. But in my mind, and with the, with the fact that they now need to be publicly notified or, or are, are held up for public scrutiny and not acceptable, that was not included in the farmer reference group discussions, or if it was, it was, it, was, um, it was deemed not acceptable by the members. So if that's ignored, then I think it's a strong point that um, that, that farmer reference group would be... Um, well, as a member of that farm reference group, uh, I, I, will, I will draw my support for the collectives. Um, I do I do worry about the 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 level of of actual monitoring that's that's been put behind these um, these. Uh, these now proposed regulations. Um, and and, and strength, of, and strength of my argument where we come from a, a, a catchment, I've, in, I've included um, four pages of the Naurora River, where if you look through its, if you look through its, um, its requirements, there's, there's not many, there's not many uh, sub-catchments and what have you that actually need to do any more than maintain or um, or just maintain its present state. So there's a lot of farmers and there's a lot of farmers in, this, in these catchment areas and sub catchments of this that, that are doing nothing wrong. They're not contributing. They're not contributing to any um, 
substandard water quality, and yet they will be asked to contribute the same cost. And, um, and forming a collective that now needs to be now needs to be convened by a, by an expert. There's just no there's just no no requirement at all to do any more than the status quo for these people. No justification in enforcing anything. So. One of, the, one of the things that's been going along through the Family Friends Group and it's been a, um, an often discussed topic was the, uh, and I'm sure it has been already, is the, um, is the settlement issue going through the Waitangi Reserve and the flood, um, the flood protection measures that are in from Marakagaho or just upstream from Marakagaho uh, through to Royce Hill and then from Royce Hill downstream to the Waitangi Reserve or just short of uh, the Waitangi Estuary. And um, and the um, and the amount of sediment and how it's been modelled coming off the hills. With our proximity, where we live at Big Hill, we, we watch the river coming out of the ranges out of the, where the scrub is. It um, and it astounds me how filthy it can be. I um, I don't know if there's been any dip test or if there can be a dip test that, 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 that can ascertain the amount of sediment coming down the river at any one time at any particular flow. But my observations are that river looks as filthy there as it does anywhere along it as it comes out of the ranges. So to be comfortable with any regulations or or uh, for the farming community to be to be uh, charged with reducing sediment, it seems obvious that we need to find out how much is going in there before it reaches the farming community. Then surely it's just a matter of uh, measuring it where it exits it, and you've got some sort of some sort of uh, insight and how big the, the farming community is, uh, how, how big a contribution the farming community is making. This is basic stuff, but I've seen, I've seen, no, seen no evidence or even an attempt to make that happen. Um, so when we, when we saw the previous submitter photos there and, and, and planting the... Um, planting the, uh, the, the sidelings and what have you over the streams and tributaries, running into the, running into the, into the um, Tutakiri in that instance. But if you look at, if you look at a, a, uh, a photo, a satellite image of, of all the areas west of Marakagaho upstream from the Narora, it does look like a a blood system capillary thing, not because of where the streams are, but because of where the vegetation is growing along the streams. And I've, I've, I've um, offered a, a couple of photos there, and um, Matt B is uh, is there, and it's not a it's not a very high quality satellite picture. I, I grant you, I've just taken off my home PC, but. Um, but those uh, tributaries and what have you, from my experience, because we, we're, we're quite elevated where we are, we actually get a, a bird's eye view looking over Hawke's Bay, and we're proud to be farmers in Hawke's Bay. We've done a good job. We've done what's been incentivised over the years, and we'll do what's incentivised in the future. We've done what's been, been considered admirable to establish these farming properties, and we've got a history as pastoral farmers in New Zealand of um, doing the best we can with the knowledge we have. And this knowledge that's coming now with water quality and what have you has to be accepted to be reasonably recent. And I think the response to it has actually been quite effective. Up. 
Mr. Grosbrook, you, you've provided us some tables as well. Was there, was there anything particularly you wanted us to? to yeah. Point so, out so to those those pages of the tables there are what's relevant to our catchment, to my to Big Hill Station's catchment. Yes. And further downstream, and the, and they and those those um, attributes yes. that are listed on those tables now. I just I just wanted to to, to offer you those to to, uh, to to flick through and and take note of the attributes the existing attributes. So as I referred to earlier, where is the need for remedial work in this instance? There's one small catchment there, the Paperangi Stream. <coughs> it's not part of my it's not part of a catchment that I'm involved in, but I happen to know that the council make allowance for. Uh, Post harvesting of, well, I, I, I believe they they make allowance for post harvesting of pine trees, and that is a um, there is a component of that at the upper end of the Paparangi stream. So my my point I'm making in, in tabling those tables and and giving you those tables is that. Um, the people involved with this catchment will be set up with the same costs and, and same compliance as people who, not, who may not be in such a fortunate position. That was the whole basis. That was the whole basis of a of a of a catchment group was to first give, being given the opportunity to collect accurate data and facts, and then remediate where established there was a problem. If you want to regulate, don't worry about that. Just regulate and we'll get that done. But don't settle us with both. Was there any further questions on those tables, sir? Uh, no, that was fine. Um, and you've also provided us with map A as well. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Thank you, there was. <laughs> so MAP-A was, was, was to, to just, just as a really reference to, to, um, to give an oversight, I suppose, about how modified the river bank, the, the river is with its, with its flood protection and, um, and how little opportunity any sediment has to go anywhere but the first still water being the estuary. So to charge the farmers basically upstream of Roy's Hill or the Marakagaho stream with reducing sediment to the point that it can alleviate the issues at the Waitangi Reserve seems, um, seems, un seems a little unrealistic. If you're almost finished with your presentation, we might see if we've got any questions for you. Was there anything else you wanted to add? If I could briefly. Yeah, sure. Um, so there was one other issue about the stock water being in there, and, I, um, and it's been changed a couple of times, and I support most of the changes, but uh, there, was a, there was a point that the previous submitter made about the um, disconnect now between authorities, administration, and, and the hands-on farmer. And the first, the first, uh, the first draft of the, of, um, of the stock water issue graphically demonstrated that. Uh, it's been mitigated a bit, and I've rethought about it. Um, and largely, and largely um, alleviates my concerns, but the, um, what, what, stock, what stock water takes must do is reflect that prior to fencing off of streams and what have you for, for planting and stock exclusion, etc. Those, those stock had, the, had access to water. And in some cases, on some properties, one running stream would be the only stock water that property has in adverse times. So 
I don't know any farmers who, who are unhappy about about um, fencing off significant waterways. But in return, they must be given unlimited access for their, for their livestock because that access predates almost any other takes that I can think of, certainly irrigation and what have you. So first claim, first use has, has been livestock. Um, I note in the, in the most re recent changes to Plan Change 9 that um, only one source of water per property, um, unless, w with some exceptions, but to, to restrict that um, to one take Maybe in a lot of cases be unre unrealistic. Um, so, an event of a spring failing that supplies supplies water to a, a portion of the a portion of the property. If a property is dissected by by altitude, so they might have a leading ridge, and the backside of the ridge might not have any access to power. They've got a. It doesn't seem. Um, unrealistic to let them have the access to another spring. And a spring in these instances aren't, they're not a, it's not a bore, it's a, it could be seasonal. There's no other evidence from it other than there's a soak that comes to the ground and otherwise recent goes, goes subterranean again. Um, but without the ability to tap those springs um, in times of variability seems unnecessarily restrained. Happily take questions, sir. Thank you, Mr. Grasbrook. Uh, Mr. Glazebrook, um, are you were you part of a, a catchment collective, or you, you had some association association with? Yes, with a, with a property on the Marakakaho stream. A and how long has that been a, in existence for? Oh, uh, eighteen months or so, I suppose. Eighteen months. Yeah, a couple of years. And that, and that was set up. What, uh, under any particular um, incentive to set that up? Uh, there was assistance, assistance by beef. It was a pilot. It was a pilot type project. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to be clear, your property is uh, in respect of Schedule Twenty Six, which you've supplied us. Yeah. Your property would sit in the headwaters of the Upper Nauru. Is that correct? Yeah. So. Um, well, if the demarcation is the cableway, some does and some doesn't. The upper, the upper and lower Nauru. So, so, so yes, but your point is that, the, according to the schedules, uh, the water quality up there is pretty good already. Yeah. Therefore, you shouldn't be required to do anything else. Um, we, we, is, that, is that a fair comment? Uh, we, we'd like the opportunity. If if, a, if it is a catchment collective, if it is a catchment collective scenario that we're looking at. We'd like the opportunity to monitor, and we're happy to report back, but um, but not in tandem with regulation. If there's going to be regulation, why why go to all the effort of administrating our own collective? Okay. And just turning to your uh, your written submission, um, you don't seem to like trout. You don't want trout <laughs> fisheries <laughs> in any in anything. Yeah. Any particular reason behind that? I'd happily catch them all out. Uh, um, no, I'm, I'm a trout fisherman and have been an avid trout fisherman. I I don't like the contradiction that they present uh, when it comes to conservation, and um, and I don't think they should be. I don't think they should be um, a consideration within the health of a river. Nothing. Um, nothing to do with um, minimum flow setting or anything in that. Regard. No, I just don't think that I just don't think they need to be a consideration in this. I think the the native fish species, fair enough, um, but I um, I just don't I don't 
I just don't believe they should be a consideration in this process, personally. All right, thank you. I just have one question. It's around modelling that you referred to in your early evidence. <coughs> um, it seems quite clear that you're quite suspicious of modelling. You don't like it. Can you just elaborate a bit more on, on what the problem is around modelling? Um, I think it's a great. I think it's a great tool for um, for further for identifying areas for further inv investigation. But if the, if the modelling can't be backed up with monitored and, or, or collected data, accurate collected data, then it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be the basis of forming regulation. That, that's, sorry, I'll, I'll say that again. So I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with modelling being the basis on which regulations are um, formed. But that, that's modelling without supportive, verifiable data, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, my only other question was going to be about the trout fishery as well, but you've answered it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Claysbrook. Was there any uh, concluding comments you wanted to make before you finish? Um, no, thank you. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Now, I understand that Mr. Stuart McIntyre is going to join us this afternoon. We're currently scheduled to go through to 4.30, so I think we'll wait till 4.30, and if he hasn't turned up, we're going to... Mr. McIntyre is under the impression that he's going to be presenting at 4.40, so we're going to, we're going to wait till 4.40. Okay. And if he's here, we'll hear him, and if he's not, we'll call it a day. So we're going to have another little break.
complication that's been caused by when you were appearing, but you're here and we're here and we're glad to hear you. Great, thank you. Okay, do I need to, no, that's coming through, good. Okay, uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, hi, my name's Stuart McIntyre and thank you for allowing uh, me as the youngest of the Turamoi trustees uh, to represent our submission on the uh, tank, plan, tank plan changes. Um, I'm accompanied by our fellow trustees um, and we'd like to thank the Regional Council for the enormous efforts thus far uh, of the tank group and the council to consult the community and allow submissions to the proposed changes and for facilitating these hearings. We would like to acknowledge support of the overall objective of the Regional Council to ensure the sustainable use of the region's resources to enable all aspects of the community and its economy, including iwi, are able to thrive for current and future generations. Uh, our family has been farming Turamui for nearly a century across three generations with a fourth generation coming on stream. Um, we're in the process of planning a sustainable future for the next century of McIntyre dependents to be good custodians of the land. Uh, our family has a history of adopting modern practices and technologies to drive both positive economic and environmental outcomes at Turamui and beyond. We're early adopters of rotational grazing, lucerne in the rotation, irrigation since the late 1960s. Uh, Land-wise, we were founding members working with strip-till cropping uh, and flame weeding, uh, and we adopted no tillage from its beginnings in the 1980s from Loch Inver through to Central Hawke's Bay. Uh, all of this was with soil and moisture conservation in mind because we know if it blew away, we were causing environmental and economic harm. We are also founding members of the Awanui Catchment Group, which has recently formed uh, to drive targeted initiatives to improve environmental and economic outcomes in the Awanui Catchment, which runs from the top of Tionapu uh, to Karamu near Longlands. In 2007, we decided to lease 93% of the farm to Apatu Farms, and this lease was progressive in several ways not only seeing investment, significant investment and more efficient use of water uh, and reliable irrigation systems, but also crop rotation clauses and soil physical composition measures over time. Part of ensuring our partnership with Apatu Farms was working to sustainable outcomes for them and us and the wider community. Jane McIntyre, who's here, remains actively farming the remaining 7% of Turamoi as a livestock block. As we approach a lease renewal in 2022, and a water consent renewal in 2023, the ambiguity and lack of clear precedence in Tank Plan Change 9 provides cause for significant concern about the ability to continue cropping sustainably on the property for us as owners and custodians and our partner lessees. How can they bridge their long-term investments with a lack of surety of what resources will be available beyond 2023? Water is a key resource for managing the soil types on Turamui sustainably. Currently on an annualised basis, we're using 41% of the allocation. And it's greater than 50% in the dry years of 2015, 16 and 1920 from when we've had water meters. Um, in the peak month, which is consistently February, we are butting up against our 28 day limit allocation uh, up to 80, 90% utilization. Um, 
we see significant changes to the water allocation framework will increase the risk that there won't be sufficient water to grow crops sustainably, particularly in these key dry months of February. We realise that an average isn't how we grow crops. Our submission included items which we support as well as items we do not support. Uh, we do support the best long-term outcomes for the circa 3,000 farms in the Hawke's Bay region. Um, having operated for nearly 100 years, adopting technology to improve, um, we wish to continue enhancing this asset for future generations which will benefit employment and food it produces while enhancing the environment. The Turamay trustees support the overall idea of Plan Change 9 to give effect to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council policy statement as well as the national policy statement for freshwater management. We recognise that this requires the Council to identify values and establish methods, including limits, to ensure those objectives are met. We support the provisions of uh, tank one and two, which recognise that successful environmental outcomes for freshwater ecological health require landowner and community support and leadership, hence joining the Awanui catchment group. Um, we don't support any government regulations which restrict or reduce farmers' ability and agility to adjust to the ever-changing weather and market conditions. We have concerns that the objectives and policies and rules being implemented are not based on enough scientific understanding of the issues that Hawke's Bay faces and have not been adequately tested and could have unattended, unintended adverse consequences to the Hawke's Bay economy and wider community, scaring away the investment. We strongly oppose the provisions which are ambiguous and where the implications for our farm or community are not clear. Rule Tank 1, Tank 2, Tank 3, Tank 5, Tank 6, Tank 7, Schedule 29 and Schedule 30. We seek that these are deleted or alternatively amended to provide clarity and ensure that they can be implemented on farm in a practical way. In particular, we seek clarity on what waterways will need to be excluded from stock access. We strongly oppose the ambiguous water takes wording in tank rule nine, specifically the wording under actual and reasonable reallocation. Section C is unclear and can mean very different amounts. For example, according to the Hiratonga Aquifer Groundwater Model Scenarios Report, the following amounts could be actual and or reasonable the actual amount of groundwater used in the dry year was 90 million cube on a regional basis. The average amount of groundwater pumped 2005 to 2015 was 76 million cube. We understand the currently regional resource consents for taking groundwater, which have been deemed reasonable in the past, were somewhere in the range of 160 to 180 million cube. The actual amount pumped in the 2019-20 years undefined. With all these figures, the words actual and reasonable use could be interpreted to mean any amount from 180 down to 76 million cube. We believe the lack of definition and ambiguity should be resolved to give us the clarity to continue investment. We are deeply concerned that stock water is not appropriately provided for in tank 16, 17 and 18 associated policies 5.1.7 and the rules. The continuous provision of water is critical to animal welfare and should be a priority above other non-essential takes. We oppose provisions which relate to the takes and management which fail to provide for stock drinking water as a priority. We're deeply concerned about the approach taken in Schedule 29, which are designed to limit nutrients leaching from productive land use. 
We oppose provisions which restrict innovation and remove the opportunity for landowners to achieve, achieve environmental outcomes while remaining adaptable to the change in circumstances. We consider sector averaging to be effectively the grandparenting of land which locks farmers at their existing farm systems and land uses, preventing the ability to adjust stocking rates, imports or change land use. Flexibility and the ability to adapt and innovate is an integral part of the resilience of the sector. We don't support any of the changes which could reduce the value of primary sector land in the Hiratonga Plains. We are deeply concerned that the Plan 9 changes will have a significant negative impact on farming activities across the region. With the limited time we've had to study these changes, we believe the cumulative effect of all the potential impacts will include additional ongoing compliance costs. These will be combined with the increased farming risks implied or incurred by the proposed changes. The overall impact of these proposed changes and the poor communication of them is likely to chill investment in the region. The approach taken in Plan Change 9 is likely to have a chilling effect on investment in primary sector in the Hiratonga Plains. This is because many of the solutions to the key questions in Plan Change 9 seek to, seeks to address are not clearly set out in its provisions. For example, critical decisions for the economics of the primary sector and the well-being of the Hawke's Bay community, such as continued access to enough water to grow crops and the ability to provide nutrients to these crops are deferred. These are to be addressed when water take consents are renewed or when nutrient leaching or other freshwater activities are tackled as part of farm environment plans on the joint plans of the water use collectives. While the broad parameters of how these are achieved are set out in Plan Change 9, the details and their potentially serious effects on local farmers are less clear. To those not familiar with planning processes, the Plan Change 9 documents present a bewildering array of information that has not been penned with the end user or the ratepayer in mind. References to the key documents, to earlier documents relied on to draft the current plan changes are sometimes inaccurate, including giving the documents inconsistent names, making it difficult to source the correct information. Some of the key components of the plan changes are very complex and poorly explained. For example, Schedule 29 land use change and how it links to other parts of the plan and what effect on growers. This makes it very difficult for people of Hawke's Bay to understand or respond effectively to this consultation process. We therefore encourage the Hawke's Bay Regional Council to think about how this plan change and its effects can be better explained by thinking through some of the key plan change provisions are likely to affect people. Worked hypothetical examples of how water take consents are expected to be reconsented, or what sorts of approaches might be expected of farmers with high nutrient or water demands could be useful. Creating regulatory burdens which negatively affect small and medium farms who by their size do not and cannot make significant negative or positive impact on our natural environment. According to Stats New Zealand, there's circa 3,000 farms in Hawke's Bay. A third of those farms account for 90% of the land area. Two thirds of those account for 7% of the land area. Imposing these regulatory process changes and constraints on the owners of 7% of the Hawke's Bay farm area appears to be statistically and economically <coughs> unjustifiable. Creating consental approval processes which restrict the ability to profitably produce food or delay farmers' ability to proceed without central approvals. We're deeply concerned that Plan Change 9 proposed changes are so complicated, so interwoven, that a significant number of farms currently under permitted rules will now be required to attain resource consents, increasing uncertainty and thereby decreasing economic returns and the returns to the region and the community. This can be justified by environmental gains, but these are often not well explained either. 
It appears that under the proposed changes, every Hawke's Bay farm will have to go through a regulatory process to gain approvals to take water, which will be reviewed on an ongoing basis. These proposed consenting processes do not provide one single permitted way to use water, thus requiring every farm owner to apply for discretionary or controlled consent to use water, regardless of size or ability to affect our natural environment positively or negatively. With every Hawke's Bay farm being required to follow a centralised region regulatory process, our next concern is that the Regional Council will be a able to process all these consent applications and renewals in a timely manner. Do you have a resource to get through the paperwork? So in conclusion, we support the tank principles to monitor and manage for better environmental outcomes. We don't support the proposals for managing water and change of land use, uh, in particular the use of averaging, exposing allocation renewal to have enough water to sustain vegetable cropping for the local and national economy. We're keenly awaiting, and it feels ironic that this data isn't in or the report isn't out to the public, to my knowledge, of the mapping that was done of the aquifer by helicopter. We look forward to the conclusion and outcomes of this process to ensure that we can operate our land sustainably for the future generations of our family and New Zealanders. Uh, thanks on behalf of all the trustees to give us the graveyard shift um, to take you through it today. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, yeah, appreciate your last comments there. This is late in the afternoon, and that, that, that was quite a bit to get through. Um, uh, appreciate your candour, and we've but we've had the opportunity to have a read of your submission. We'll see if we've got any questions. Thank you. Um, you expressed concern about the um, definition of actual and reasonable. Um, I just wanted to clarify with you, is that in relation to how, it's, how it was drafted in the proposed plan change? or um, And have you had a chance to look at the a revised or recommended revised definition of actual and reasonable that's set out in the um, section 42A addendum report? that was released just before the hearing? Yeah, so um, what we have done is just come from this meeting with our tenants who I think are submitting tomorrow and yes. they've input some That's professional right. advice on that and what still stands is the concern that that actual and reasonable definition still doesn't achieve the 95th percentile uh, allocation. So it creates more risk that we are not going to have enough water for crop production. So, <clears throat> the, the, the bulk of your property is leased to Apatu Farms. Are they using your consented water or their own, or, or what's the story there? The consent's in our name. Right, yeah. so just, just trying to think how, in your particular situation, how the plan change would, would affect either you as a, as a property owner and and the water supplier versus the lease, the leasee. Um, and mm. Well, as I relayed, we're sort of going for renewal after a 15-year lease and a very successful lease with them. We've been irrigating since the 1960s at an uh, annual level. We're fine. But when we're into the allocation on the basis of 28 day, seven days, we do run up against it and if the new allocation cuts that down significantly then we would have to stop cropping. Um, so I'm not sure if, it, if it's applicable to your situation but if you, if your property had to prepare a freshwater farm plan, would that fall on your shoulders, your trustees shoulders or or the leases? Do you know, it's a great question because we're sort of seeking precedent, we're discussing it with our tenants, we're asking our lawyers, we're asking industry experts and we're trying to take a collective approach where actually we do it together. Right. Okay. 
the legal definition might be different yeah. to that? What would your answer to that be? <laughs> I'm seeking answers. Yeah. Oh, thank you. No further questions for me. Yes, thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Your farm's in the Awanui catchment, is that right? Yeah, we're actually in between the Awanui and the Paratua and the Kariwariwa because it changes its name as it flows downstream. Our physical property only touches the Awanui drain. So that flows into the Awanui catchment, have I got that right? Or it flows into the others as well? It ends up in the Karamu. How big is the property? Uh, it's 177 hectares. And so is it on rolling country or predominantly flat country to be cropped? It's predominantly flat with some uh, hills, uh, hillocks really, um, on the edges of the property, but it's largely flat. So in the old terms it would be class two or three land, predominantly class two? Plains land productive. Ironically, the district plan does say that our hills are plains land productive, but we think we can get that clarified and sorted with the district council. Um, but yes, it's zoned plains productive. So you use fertiliser and nitrogenous fertiliser on the property? Yes, in fact, today they were applying fertiliser with the uh, forecast rinsing of rain. And phosphate, any? Yeah. So it is fertilised? It is fertilised, yes. Little and often, not big loads, and uh, managed and measured sure. by the tenants, I might add, at, at, in the current regime. So who are the Taramao trustees? Are they... Uh, collective of, they're the people behind you. So it's a... It's a, it's a family property, and um, uh, just recently all my siblings have come on as trustees. So it's an old family farm that is yep. run by a group of trustees and largely leased out. Now, used to be actively farmed by my mother and father and uh, I was running it also before I went overseas, but then we decided leasing it. Um, as I mentioned, we went progressive with our lease for the times and put sustainability clauses in the lease, both in terms of physical uh, management of the soil uh, and rotation. And is your water supply from surface water or bore or both? Uh, bores. We used to irrigate from three bores on the property with travelling irrigators. We now irrigate from two bores. One runs two large pivot irrigators and then one well runs some fringe flat land that needs irrigating. So is that fringe flat land irrigated by a K-line or something? No, like by hose travelling gun. In your original evidence, you referred to, and you can correct me if I got you wrong, <coughs> the fact that the plan lacks sufficient science underpinning. Those are my words, not your words, but that's what I read. Did I read it correctly? Yeah, you did. Okay. Has anything changed since the time you wrote that and now? Because you didn't mention it this afternoon, or maybe I missed it. I, I did mention it this afternoon, um, and what I would say, an example of that is we look forward to the results of the helicopter underwater. Um, we would contend the causality of um, well to stream um, impact, mm. which I know is one of the large sort of ahas of uh, the science and the implications for us in terms of compliance downstream. Um, we know that one well, which ironically is closer to the Awanui, and in the same soil type as the Awanui stream, has been declared not to 
have any causality on the Awanui, whereas our other well, which is further away and in a different soil substructure, is allegedly linked to impacting the Awanui. So we feel we'll be heading into, as a community, needing to invest in a well to prime the Awanui if there's any low flows. Oh. Ironically, this year the well's lower than the peak of the drought last year, but the Awanui's flowing higher. Good, thank you. Uh, just regards the, uh, this is just more regards the farm environment plans. You've said that you'd like sh Schedule 30A. I I'm thinking you're meaning that it should reduce the complexity and confusion about what's required. So I was just wondering if you had a, a particular view of what, yeah, I mean, what would be helpful. I think nationally um, there's a few storms and teacups around farm environment mm -hmm. plans and what's needed and professional consultants and costs. I think what we're learning is actually they can be done relatively simplistically, but yeah, there's not much precedent and there's a lot of ambiguity about what is exactly needed in a farm environment plan. And I think the general theme is some more precedent and clarity helps take away risk, you know where you stand, whereas our feeling is we're a bit unclear where we stand. Okay. Uh, that, and you're meaning specifically from the regional council perspective what's required as opposed to the industry, number of industry dot yeah. types of plans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming at the end of the day. And, thanks uh, for rounding the time. Off our submission and thank you to the trustees who have also attended. Um, that's the end of our questions. So, thank you. Uh, we thank look you very forward much. to the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. That's our last submitter for the day, and tomorrow we're a nine o'clock start. And at this stage, it looks like we've got a full day of submissions. I don't think we've had anybody indicate that they're pulling up this last far, so. No, 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 and Nicola, just to confirm, we've got legal submissions so far from Heinz Watties in Global for tomorrow, that's all. Thank you. What was the other one? The do, 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 do. Field is going to come for that one. Yep. Okay. And I'm assuming that Mare is not going to close us off today. Did we? Did we have a view about how we're going to close the day, or we're we going to wait to the end of the hearing? Oh, nobody wanted to close the day. I thought you were doing it for the whole week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're just confirming. It's Mare started it off this morning, and so we're just going to leave that open and. Um, We'll close things off either with Mare's help or we'll sort that out at the end of the end of Friday. We'll have a good evening everybody and we'll see you nine o'clock tomorrow. <laughs>